Morning, gentlemen. Morning, Jay. Morning. Welcome to uh, the BMF uh, Extra, um, man to man. <laughs> Excited to uh, <laughs> talk about uh, business. Before we start, though, let me just uh, simply ask you to uh, give them um, a two minute, if you can sum it up in two minutes. Uh, what convinced you that uh, Jesus was worth following? And Duncan, we'll start with you. What convinced you that Jesus was worth following? Uh, well, I was I was kind of taken to uh, a church at an early age after my, my mother uh, came to know the Lord Jesus as Lord and Saviour in her life. And um, what I was a young boy at that time, I think I was about seven years old. And what I recognised immediately amongst the people were was a was a love that I hadn't experienced in in any other places. You know, they were accepting and loving, and uh, that was that was good because I was a bit of a terror when I was young and often get invited to leave places rather than uh, <laughs> invited in. Uh, so so that the love of the people. Uh, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ was was an attraction, first of all. And then hearing the stories of the Bible stories, I was in, 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 engaged with uh, his ministry and the healing ministry and the fact that, uh, um, to me, he was uh, he, the, he supported the underdog, as it were, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that was an attraction. And I loved healing. I loved to see, hear things of healing. And the church we went to, there were people in it who came with stories. Uh, the minister at the time had spent 27 years in China as a missionary, and he came with stories that were were astoundingly good, and they were uh, they excited me as a young boy. And then later on, uh, I, I uh, became a believer myself uh, in my teens. So the attraction was the acceptance and the love of the people, the stories that I heard about Jesus, both uh, in the Bible and stories that, that were current within people's own, li own lives. So that was, that was what attracted me. Mark, how about you? Thank you. Thank you for asking. And I would echo much of what Duncan has said. When we're mindful that uh, over 80 percent of Christians come to faith before their 25th birthday, we're reminded how critical it is that our churches supply leaps, lay on leadership, inspirational, visionary leadership with young people, children, and young people. And so I became convinced on the 1st of June 1973, when I was 11 years of age. But building up to that, building up to that time, um, I became increasingly convinced as a young boy at primary school still under the age of 11 that uh, following Jesus was was going to be the right thing to do for the rest of my life. So it was down to the faithfulness of what I might now call lovely old dears but they were probably about 16 or 18 years of age when I was 11 but these lovely old dears who faithfully brought scriptures brought the bible to life for us all week by week and we weren't easy as Sunday school kids. You know, we made life difficult. I think I might have mentioned on a previous discussion we've had that um, we were the guys who brought the stink bombs in and brought the mice in and the stick insects and all the other things to disrupt the smooth running of a Sunday school class. But uh, for me, I became convinced at 11 years of age. Why did I become convinced? Because very evidently to me, Jesus Christ was the son of God. And he has something to say to me and to the world. And uh, that was 40 years ago. So um, if I could elaborate on the question, um, what has convinced me to keep following Jesus beyond that profession of faith would be the way in which God works in my life and those around me. And it's so evident, it's almost frustrating when I'm sharing my faith with people that um, the evidence of God's love and care uh, for each one of us is so evident and yet people almost fail to grasp it. But that's the challenge of the Christian faith and our job as Christians to witness well for him. Thank you. Thanks. And Alan. Hi, Jesus, bless you. Well, it's, the thing with me, I had a, a real fear of death. From being young, I had a fear of death. And um, when I, I was working in the industry, uh, there was one night where I, I was poisoned by gas 
and uh, collapsed and conscious on the floor. I was, and someone found me lying on the floor. I was rushed to a hospital. I was on oxygen for about five hours. And the doctor thought I was going to die. And I had a real fear of death. And two, two of my friends had been killed in accidents. And then after getting married, our, our first children, twin girls, they died after two days. You know, what happens after death? What happens with these children? You know, um, what happens when I die? I'm buried in the ground, but where, where am I, the real person? And I realized I would, I would be in hell. And then my wife's twin brother at 24 years old suffocated in his sleep. And so you can imagine what it was like being gripped with the fear of death. And then I met a man who told me that Jesus could set me free. We were almost involved in a, in a, car, in a serious car accident. We could have been killed. And uh, I remember this voice saying to me, where will you spend eternity? And I knew that if I died, I would have been lost forever. But I, th I thank God that uh, Jesus revealed himself to me and I became uh, a born again believer. And now I'm, I have no fear of death. I know that I have life. I know I have eternal life now. And when this life is over, I will go to be with the Lord forever. So <laughs> yeah, he's worth following. He's a wonderful savior. <laughs> Amen. Well, uh, welcome, Jordy. It's good to uh, have you with us. I, I'm, but this, I did not want to miss this. So thank you very much for having me. And I'm sorry I'm a little bit late. Oh, no worries. It's great to have you. Um, let me uh, jump straight in with you then. Um, how do you stay away from a love for money while being successful in business then? I go back to that wonderful scripture that the love of money is a root of all <laughs> kinds of evil. Um, and it's the love of it that the Lord wants to deal with, I think. Um, I'm dealing in very expensive pieces of jewelry. So I'm meeting people who spend enormous sums of money and I rely on them. And I sometimes think, Lord, how good ethical right is this business? And I keep coming back to the fact that I believe he loves the business and he put the gemstones, which is what I sell that he put them in the ground and the bible's full of stories and i think we're going to see heaven new jerusalem streets paved with gold it's it's not as if the lord is anti the nice things of life and they cost money and so money is something that makes the world go round but the lord wants our heart before he wants the world to go round for us in that respect and i uh i can only speak from experience i've had two times when i the first time when i um, had a bonus that was quite meaningful, uh, certainly in proportion to my salary. I'm in a family business, 20 years, uh, started without any special favors at all. And, um, and then as money got a little bit more, so does the cost of life with three children. And we had this bonus in Dublin about 10 years ago, having had a very good year. And it was either buy a, 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 you know, a half decent car, but not have it on finance, or, uh, or something, but it was, a, you know, it was a considerable amount of money for where I was at then. And Kirsty, very godly wife, slightly frustrating sometimes to have a godly wife, gents, isn't it? Because she immediately felt the Lord wanted us to give it all away. And I'll be honest and say we compromised, but certainly it was nearer her figure than my figure. And that broke something in me. We then had another lesson quite soon after that and actually Mark Mitchell on here, I've, I, I'm not going to say what happened publicly, but I know Mark knows, he's a good friend of mine, where we felt the Lord saying to give something quite substantial that left us lacking or apparently lacking. And so there's a costly giving where the Lord, and I think the first question is where you say, Lord, please have my heart as a businessman. And if you pray that prayer, it's not just a one-off. I'm giving you two examples. I need to go on, and it goes on being a challenge. But I do believe something broke before there was a love that really set in. So either at the beginning or somewhere in the middle, you know, in our lives, we need to break a love of money there because it's probably going to emerge sooner or later. Yeah. Mark, would you like to add anything onto that? It's a real issue, and let's not in any way try and brush this under the table. And I know if one looks at the detail of the scripture, it's, um, it's a love for money uh, rather than having money. But, you know, as a business, as a business builds, you know, yeah. the financial rewards can be higher. Um, 
And there are times, I think, especially for fellas, and I'm in, uh, by way of introduction, I, I have a number of car dealerships. Uh, we represent Lexus uh, and Mazda uh, and uh, Skoda, which is a Volkswagen branded product. And uh, for the listeners who know their cars, I know that one of our Lexus cars is 350,000 pounds. But equally, we'll happily pass on a car to a missionary for two or 3,000 pounds. So you can see the width and the breadth of our business. We deliver about 2,500 cars every year. Yeah. And um, I think for fellas, sometimes we're attracted to toys in the Western world. And, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I know people who buy sports cars. I know people that buy uh, all manner of expensive treats when they don't need them, but they buy them because they can. And our lives become cluttered, if we're not careful, with things that perhaps God doesn't necessarily want us to have. It may draw us a little bit further away from him. Um, I don't think it's the be all and end all. I don't think having a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or a Porsche is a bad thing, but it then spins over into how you're wired as a Christian and where your values are. Yeah. Now, for the first 18 years of my life, I went to an amazing church and was encouraged, blessed, taught in my early steps of Christian. But it wasn't until I went to university. Um, and the first month I went to a lively Anglican church, charismatic Anglican church. And the subject, surprisingly, not surprisingly, was on giving for young undergraduate students. And I heard for the first time about the concept of tithing. And that quite unsettled me because I was doing very well uh, with my business sidelines. I had a little motorbike business and a car business at university. And the prospect of giving 10% of my profits, at least the Lord, was quite unsettling. But I heard this message. I uh, understood it was backed up by scripture. And I thought, well, that's what I need to do as part of my Christian journey. So I gave 10% of my student grants away and 10% of my business venture profits away as well. So um, that's stood by me all through life. And the, the other measure, of course, is how much we take out of our businesses. And although our business, probably to give you some perspective, started off 30 years ago with about half a million pounds a year coming in, it's now about 50 million pounds a year. So if you do the ratios, the numbers, business is more successful. But Anitra and I, you know, except on an occasion when we had to move house, we've taken the same amount out each year. And so we try to honor God in our financial dealings. But, um, you know, we're full of, life is full of temptations for us. In the Western world in particular, there are things that come across on the television screens and newspaper advertising, um, all manner of fields where it would be very easy, even as Christians, to be focused on prosperity. And that's a big thing I struggle with. So we need to know how far we should go with our businesses in terms of the gifts and abilities God's given us to lead a business of a certain size. And I know in my situation, I'm in the right place with that. And if we'd gone much bigger uh, for the love of money, back to the question, I think I'd have struggled commercially, but more importantly, spiritually as well. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thank you for that. Duncan, I'm going to uh, change the question on you. Okay. Um, how, because uh, it kind of fits into this actually, but um, how would you say within the business world, uh, you would stay ethical? How do you remain ethical in a, in a world of uh, business as a Christian? Well, I, I, was, I wasn't in the business world. I worked for 40 years in the National Health Service and ended up managing uh, uh, physiotherapy services across Fourth Valley Health Board for the 150 so people in the staff and um, in terms of being ethical, I think you've got to be uh, you've got to be truthful um, in in your dealings with with people. Um, I, I I was confronted one time with uh, you know it was a political thing that happened. Um, uh, the health service very political and um, one of my staff had invited someone to come and speak at a, a postgraduate meeting uh, a politician and it was coming up for an election and the chairman of the health board at the time was very political as well and uh, I got um, um, this member of staff uh, was 
was going to be dragged up in front of uh, a lot of, um, you know, the senior senior manager at health board level, and and I I had given my permission for her to invite this chap, this uh, MP, and I was naive at the time to think that that was uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, anyway, I said uh, she was being called up to on the carpet before the chairman of the, the health board, and I decided she's not going. I'm going to go, and her, you know, and because it was my responsibility uh, in the first place, because I had given her permission to do this. So I went and uh, was carpeted by the the chairman of the health the health board now. That was pretty serious, and I might well have uh, lost my, my job over that. Um, however, I didn't. Uh, but my, the, the key point is that <clears throat> I was standing up for someone that, that uh, I th felt needed to be supported, and it was my, my call, it was my responsibility. Um, and I, I think just being ethical in that to... to to stand up and be counted when you've made a mistake or, or, you know, that's a good thing to do and to be truthful and as far as you're able in every situation that, that confronts you. So that was... That's great. Yeah. Jody, if I can ask you the same question. I was just saying that was very well said, by the way. Uh, thanks for that response. I, there's two words that are quite closely uh, linked here, aren't there? There's ethics, um, and then there's integrity, being true to yourself and doing the right thing. And so I can't really, I can't, I wouldn't want to take the two apart. I think answering the question is, you know, what is, as a Christian, where does integrity, that should speak of ethics, doing the right thing because we're doing what God wants. So our ethics are sticking true to who we are as Christians. And it's a challenge in business, but it's only a challenge as much as you allow uh, compromise and I think starting small interestingly I've just remembered as I'm speaking that I would never go past uh, a one penny piece or five pence piece that I might see on a train floor or on the floor in a street at a principle that I would always pick it up just to say Lord uh, the small things you're looking at the small things um, I haven't been on the lookout for those coins recently, but I will, I will resume that. I think that just speaks of keeping it simple and, key, and being honest uh, with the Lord and saying, you know, you are looking at the small things, no matter how small they are. That might sound a bit pathetic because there are much bigger issues. But I think if you don't stray at the beginning, then you're unlikely to find yourself in a situation that even is an issue um, or, or a situation because before you're even close, you're smelling it. And so therefore you can preempt and deal with it. But sure, I find myself in situations uh, here and there on varying degrees of um, challenging my ethics from big things like how diamonds are sourced, gold, perhaps more of an issue. Um, it's not always correct. I mean, certainly not correct. The way gold is produced, still 30, 40 percent of it is produced in, in countries like Ghana, where there's kids in mines, mines collapse. They're not given fair wages. There's, you know, the governments are behind the whole thing. So, um, and I've answered some of those things and it's been quite a painful experience of, of getting somewhere whilst trying to run a business. I mean, we can't just not buy gold anymore unless we want to shut the door. And I feel, you know, you do as much as you can and we've got to place as it happens by buying gold directly from a mine, which is, it's funny, the Lord almost gave us that opportunity. It was an old school friend of mine and I thought, gosh, I've heard he's doing certain things in, in Mali, um, West Africa, which to do with gold. And I know he's a player. His grandfather was in the diamond industry, in the gold industry. Got in touch with him and we formed a plan, which is that my, our, our gold all now comes, or pretty much all of it, they don't quite have enough, comes from their mine. Hummingbird run it. Uh, it's a listed company now. Um, and it's called Single Mine Origin. So slowly but surely with being on the lookout and having a concern and a, and, a, and a compassion for people, I think that leads you to making good decisions. But you need quite thick skin as well, because I think if you got worried about everything, what is per perfect doesn't really exist on planet Earth as it is, let alone in business. 
And so you just have to be quite discerning and quite pragmatic with a relationship that is close, close in tune with the Lord. Um, I mean, I think it's easier saying no to things than it is saying uh, yes, in the sense that saying you know, new ventures, you can just see that's not going to be quite the right direction or those people I don't particularly, it might be cheaper, but I, I just don't feel quite right with them. So you shut the door before you open it. Um, better building on what you know and making a difference there. That tends to be a rule of thumb for me. I don't think I've answered that very well, but that's good. No, no, that, that's great. I'm going to uh, change up the question and go to Alan with this question. How do you pray and see God, uh, God's favour in your work? So how, how do you pray and see God in uh, what you do? Okay, well, at the moment, of course, I'm working with BMF Life Stories. And uh, each day we pray where we should send life stories to. Because uh, there are so many parts of the world that need the gospel. And so each day I pray, Lord, where do you want these stories to go to? And then also with our Monday night Zoom meeting, I, I pray, Lord, who do you want to speak on these Monday night Zoom meetings? Because whatever is going out on the Monday night is very important. And there are many, many people all over the world being reached through these Zoom meetings. So that's what I'm doing at the moment, praying <laughs> for God's plan to come into operation through these life stories. Great. And because of the amount of people you're reaching, you can see God's favor on your work. Oh, man. That's great. Mark, same question to you then. How do you pray and see God's favor in your work then? I, I thought you'd ask me about ethics as a secondhand car salesman here. Because uh, no. <laughs> I'd have taken that both hands up. Um, interesting enough, just to, to mark on the, on the ethics issue, um, you know, you might put cars in the same bracket as life assurance or um, uh, real estate, estate agency, or in the UK where we get cold winters, double glazing salesmen. <laughs> so it's interesting as a Christian to make your mark, if you'll forgive the pun, in a sector where we traditionally don't display the highest levels of integrity uh, and, uh, and, and, and high levels of ethics as well. Praying, praying in the business. Um, it's, it's, it's how we're wired, isn't it? If we work for ourselves, even more so perhaps, our work can go as far as preoccupy us. We would like to say it's a ministry, it's what God's called us to do. Um, and I didn't really appreciate that what I was doing was as important as some other Christian ministries until probably into my mid thirties until pennies started dropping and words of encouragement arrived. But, um, uh, we have very close relationships with the car manufacturers we work with and uh it's tagged as a partnership but it's a little bit of an unbalanced partnership on occasions so i i would pray for good working relationships with the three automotive brands we represent and i want to be probably one of a very small number of christians they engage with and i want to engage well and credibly uh, as a christian guy in terms of seeking God's favor, um, much of that I would say is down to me praying for wisdom about appointing the right staff. We have just over 100 staff and um, thankfully we, we lose very few, maybe three or four a year in an industry that loses 30 or 40 for every 100 folk you employ. Um, so I seek God's favor in staff appointments and um, that's something I, we investigate very thoroughly. In terms of praying, um, I, I guess I bring at least two or three times a week some of the demands and challenge the business to God. I also ask close Christian friends to pray with me and for me as well. And that too is a highlight and a really important discipline for me as I lead the business. Do you, do I don't, you find... Go on. Sorry, well, I was just going to jump on that praying with other Christians. Do you find other Christian than business um, understand where you're coming from when you need them to pray into things where you are? I think if you've got some pals in the business world, I know Jody is, he's uh, kindly referred to 20 minutes or so ago. Jody and I would know um, a dozen, dozen friends, Christian friends with similar sized businesses across the UK. We're all in different sectors, but we face some very similar challenges and joys. Um, so there's that. What I don't do is pray for prosperity. I don't pray for 
business success beyond my wildest dreams. That's something that um, I think some Christians would say would be a very clear indication of my walk with God and God's hand on our business. I, I just pray that we can be wise and as Paul reminded us, we can have the mind of Christ in the decisions we have to make hour by hour, day by day in the business. Yeah, that's great. This is great so far. Bundles of wisdom. I'm loving it. Um, let me ask you then, uh, we'll start with Ed Duncan on this one. What have you learned from your failures? What have you um, brought and learned from your failures as a Christian in life? Hey, what have I learned from my failures? Um, one of the, one of the things, uh, one of the scriptures that I, uh, I adhere to is trust the Lord with all your heart. And don't rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. And you know, and uh, there have been failures in my life, and and they've, they've often been in in relationships with. Uh, with people are failure to do something that I should have done, omitted to do, a bit because of a, a possibly fear or, or indolence or even a virgin and negligence, you know. And uh, um, I, I once went to uh, chasing money <laughs> uh, when I was younger. I, I, would, I, I was a qualified physiotherapist in clinical work. And I decided to go into clinical teaching um, and because the money was better. Um, and I, I, I went into clinical teaching and I didn't like it at all. In fact, I, 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 I so disliked it, um, being a challenge with a, a class of, of students to, and all the preparation that goes around that and and what have you, and the fear of failure and, and not getting that right for these students was something that was uh, really difficult. Anyway, I, you know, after I, being challenged in this and, you know, almost coming to a position of uh, um, mental uh, or, or psychological, uh, not breakdown, but stress, I decided I would go back into clinical work again. And that's where my heart was. That's where I should be. And I shifted out of education back into clinical physiotherapy. Um, and the failure that I had was not in completing the, the, the task I'd set for myself in education. Um, the other failure that was a, 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 to do with staff again, this uh, one of my staff um, was cited in a fatal accident inquiry to do with a, a patient that she was treating and all the rest of it. And I wasn't appreciative of how serious that was at the time. Her being cited as a witness, she was being, she was actually being accused of, a, 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 you know, a, of doing things clinically that weren't appropriate. And as a result of that, this, this person died. Um, and instead of me supporting her as I should have done uh, and making sure that the legal stuff was in place from our, uh, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy and all that, I didn't do that. And I regretted it because she, was, uh, she had a bad experience in the court and uh, it upset her greatly. And I had later on to apologise to her uh, for, for not supporting her and failing her at a time when I should have been uh, alongside her and supporting her in that, that fatal acts inquiry. So that was a failure, uh, you know, um, but on balance, <laughs> uh, I'm pleased to say there's a lot more uh, success uh, and, and my dealings with people and, and staff and all the rest of it and clinical outcomes than there ever were failures because I trust the Lord, uh, you know, with all my heart. And I don't rely always on my own understanding and I should have maybe checked in with him earlier than I did when I failed <laughs> on these number of occasions. Yeah. That's great. 
Jordi, how do you uh, deal with uh, well, what have you learned from your failures is the question. I'm quite a um, strong leader. I don't mean that in that I'm a good leader, but I'm quite a strong leader. I know what I want. I have an opinion on things and I tend to think I'm right. That's um, me being humble in that I'm open enough to say it. Uh, I'm often wrong, really often wrong. But because I'm a Christian and I know where I'm at before God, there's a being humble is for me often what I, how I see myself looking back. But the question is, are you going to then go and be humble? Like, does that change the decision in the moment? Or do you just operate out of your strengths again, which are also big weaknesses? For example, I mean, as I say, I'm a strong leader. I don't, I'm not saying I'm, I'm a good one, but I'm passionate. I'm focused. I know what I like. And I tend to focus on people that I think are productive. It means that I'm not bringing enough out of people who are apparently not so productive. Um, don't spend enough time perhaps there. I've got a strong social awareness. I can walk into a room and sort of feel whether a customer's happy, what's right, is the shop right, the music's not on, the light's not right, all those sorts of things. The flip side of that is the social anxiety. If something isn't right, I perhaps feel it quite deeply and want to sort it out. And actually it's his fault. And I'm, you know, why the heck hasn't that manager got, got his head around things? So I can feel a bit too deeply. And I think acting humbly is knowing... Number one, sleep on it. My uncle often says, what you worry about on Monday is not even an issue by Friday. You've forgotten it quite often by Friday. So problems that are quite big on the face of it, sleep on it. Um, and at least by Friday, it should be okay. But I think for me, the lesson I'm learning really to answer this question genuinely is when I'm facing decisions, actually, am I acting humbly? I, I've been wrong before rather than just bowling in and then thinking, yeah, maybe I was a bit too strong there and that's a nice humble response. It's like, let's get it right now. Let's learn from it now. And perhaps that quiet person in the corner might have something to, to add to this. Uh, so it's, it's just pausing a bit, not relying too much on my own understanding or strengths and leaning on the Lord, as you said a moment ago. I'm still learning and I still shoot from the hip a bit too quickly most of the time. <laughs> that's great. Mark, how about you? What have you learned from your failures? Jody's business and ours is similar in, in a number of respects and that we both engage with the general public and we both would purport to um, want to do things well and present well and have our staff presenting well because we're Christians and we think that reflects on our witness. So as such, we want to lead well. So I love the book of James. And uh, I've just opened my Bible and suddenly what Jody said resonated very clearly there. In the first chapter, we, we read um, that the brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because riches will pass away like a wild flower. And for me, when I'm out and about in a, one of our three businesses, um, I too notice things that aren't right. And when one's asked staff on a number of occasions to make sure something is right, could be the music, could be a crisp packet on the floor, could be a scruffy desk, could be someone who's not presented well, that frustrates me. And um, in chapter three of James, we talk about taming the tongue, and that's something I have struggled with over the years. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. And further down, um, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest, California, is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire. But no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. And this is the balance. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who've been made in God's likeness. Mm. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. And I can be still, you know, 30 years in business, I can be too quick off the mark. And I tell myself I balance that with a pastoral concern for my colleagues. And uh, it's been a great joy to visit them at home when they've had exciting highlights of their lives like having a child and taking 
gift, a gift round and, a, and the scriptures for the newborn baby. Um, walking a journey with two staff this month whose immediate family members have taken their own lives, committed suicide. And that too has been a, uh, a great privilege and responsibility. Sometimes I tell myself, well, that's the two sides of Mark Mitchell you get. You get the pastoral leader who's concerned for people, but you also get someone who expects nothing but 100% from people. And sometimes I guess my expectations are a little high of my colleagues in the business. So that's something I'd allude to in terms of a, an ongoing challenge uh, and yeah. probably failure uh, in terms of the question you've asked us. Yeah. That's great. Alan. Can I just add something to, to that, Keith? Yeah, of course. A few different aspects that the Lord showed me. One thing was when I became a Christian, I got so on fire for God and I wanted to be at every meeting, wanted to do everything for God, go everywhere. But you know, I neglected my wife and family. And I think that is a danger uh, for people who become Christians and then want to go on with God. But that one thing I learned, and I thank God I've been able to give more time to my wife give more time to my family. I found that was one thing I had to change. The other thing I learned was to be obedient to God. You know, one thing God told me, he said, if you don't obey me in small things, how can I trust you in greater things? And so I've learned I need to listen to the voice and to obey. You know, he told me one day, he said, when you were 11 years old, you stole a comic from a newsagent in town. He said, I wanted to go to that newsagent to pay the money you owe him. It was years before. But you know, I had no peace until I obeyed God and I went and I paid that money to, to that news agent. And then he said, do you remember when you were working in industry, how many things you borrowed from that firm, books and pens? You see, you didn't borrow even the story. He said, do you remember how many times you used the firm telephone for your own telephone conversation and you didn't pay for it? Do you remember how many times you came in late at lunch you should have been working. You were out playing miniature golf and you were being paid for it. He said, I want you to pay back to that firm the money you owe them. I couldn't believe it. I said, how much is it, Lord? He gave me a figure. I had no peace until I paid that. And so I've learned now to listen to the voice of God because it's so important. One day he said, write a letter to Brenda and tell her what happened to you. She, I used to work with her when I worked in the industry. I hadn't seen her for years. But I wrote a letter to her and her husband telling her our lives had been changed. The next day, she was going to commit suicide. It was going to kill a little baby girl. And just before she did, she got my letter. And as a result of that, she, she, uh, she didn't commit suicide. She came to the Lord. Her brother, uh, her three sisters were saved. Her mother and father were saved. But her husband was an atheist. And he divorced her because she'd become a Christian. But after 36 years, he formed me. He was very ill. He was, he was dying. And on that night, he, he gave his life to Jesus. The next, and shortly after, the next morning, he died. But I'm saying how important it is to obey God, whatever he tells you. And I've learned later, when he tells you to speak to somebody, I think we've missed so many opportunities. I've failed many times in the past of sharing the gospel with people he brought across my path. And I'm sure that many of us, God brings people across our path to <clears> share <throat> the truth, the gospel with, and we miss it. And I yeah. think that's one thing we need to learn on. Absolutely. Well, you've answered my question. I was going to say, how do you uh, witness to uh, those around you? But you've answered that. Um, you <laughs> obey the Lord. I've got a question or a follow-up question. How, how did they? Um, how did the company respond? And how did the news agent respond when you went up and told them what the Lord has asked you to do? Were they? They looked puzzled. <laughs> they couldn't understand it. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> Jodie, how do you um, take the time to witness to your colleagues and those who you're working with in business? And well, I mean, they all know I'm a Christian. Uh, some I've had very deep conversations with. Quite a few I've just had surface conversations about. Um, I, I've started in recent, actually since lockdown, probably only six weeks ago, a weekly prayer meeting because one girl in our Manchester branch has become a Christian during lockdown, which is very exciting. And I think even if she watched this, which perhaps she will, I'm going to say she was the wildest person in our company. Um, and so it's most exciting that she has come to the Lord. And we, so my wife and I, and 
two ladies in our team. I think Kirsty, it makes it appropriate my, having my wife there rather than myself and two of our, our, our um, ladies that are Christians. And the four of us do a Zoom prayer meeting on, it was Monday, so it's now Tuesday mornings. And we just pray for colleagues, anything that's going on in, you know, I can share a few things. So I have a slightly broader picture on. And we pray for business and we pray for um, colleagues. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting and it's getting it going. But I think um, the witnessing, it's bringing Christian friends often into the business because it's hard to go into the same business with the same people day in, day out and coming up with new ways of witnessing. I think actually that's the lifestyle, but it never settles very well for me. It feels a cop out actually to just do it with our lifestyle. That speaks louder than words once they know you're a Christian. So there's a challenge there, of course, as well. But I think also, we've got a very good friend, Andrew Cannon, who's full on, um, a wonderful guy, proper scouser. And we meet for lunch. I always say, come into the shop and I'll introduce him to the team. And then I'll nip upstairs for 10 minutes, having something to do and just let him loose. He'll, he's had about 20 minute you know, conversations and all of them have heard the gospel very, very clearly. Well, I can't really do that. So I think having people like you can, and I know Mark, I mean, to, sorry to pick on Mark again, but Mark's very good at this, inviting colleagues to events. Well, for me, I haven't quite gone that route, and I should, and I will. But these sorts of videos and various things that I've done, talking about my story, I've then pieced that, pushed that towards certain members of staff that I feel would benefit from hearing it. So it's sharing something inadvertently. Um, right. mm. that, that probably answers some of it. That's great. Mark, how would you uh, go about um, witnessing then? I think with our colleagues, um, we're in it for the long haul with them. Um, out of my 100 full-time teams, uh, 70 have worked with me for 10 years or longer. So we know each other well and we're, we're traveling through life together. I have two other committed Christians on the team. And if you stopped in the street, the same number of people and asked them if they were Bible believing Christians, you'd probably get the same answer, two or three people. Uh, and as such, I'm really mindful of Paul talking about our gifts. And I'm not sure everyone is called to be an evangelist. And I'm certainly not sure that I should be uh, using evangelism as a tool with my immediate colleagues day in day out i think i'm called to be salt and light to them and to be a pastor to them because for many of them i'm, I'm the closest they're going to get to having a link with a christian church leader so um i'm fortunate like jody i probably got about we got about 23,000 customers. 20% of my customers would be card-carrying Christians. People choose to support us and, and do business with us because they know what makes us tick and they know the areas we feel passionate about locally and further afield we want to support with our profits each year. So um, many of our guests do a brilliant job in my staff just saying a word in season for me. And that's, as I think as Jerry indicated, it's almost easier and sometimes more effective than, than saying it ourselves. Yeah. That said, um, I decided very early on I would not open my businesses on a Sunday. And we're very unusual to be shut on a Sunday. So I'm tagged across our region as that Christian car guy who shuts on a Sunday. Um, it may sound a negative standpoint, but when you overlay it with the fact you want your colleagues to be the best mothers, best fathers, best husbands, best wives, and not have a Tuesday off, but have a Sunday off with their family, um, it starts to spin into a positive. Yeah. And we also decide to celebrate Christmas with our customers. And so every year for 14 years now, we've, um, we've booked Chester Cathedral, which holds 1,400 people, uh, 1,300 people. And we have an amazing Christmas celebration. And we have a fantastic band singing carols in a really upbeat, contemporary kind of way. And we go through about 2,000 mince pines and mulled wine and have a speaker. <laughs> who presents a, a fresh Christmas message with humor, but with passion. And, and they're the kind of things probably that I sense I'm being called to do year by year in business. We're going to um, wrap it up with our final question and I'll uh, kick off with, um, first of all, gents, this has been great. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to do this. So let me um, kick off with my final question with Duncan. 
Hilton, how do you stay humble when everything is going well? So how do you stay kind of humble? Uh, we, we touched on this a little bit, but how do you stay humble when everything's going really well for you? Uh, well, I, I, I kind of remember my background and, and uh, uh, I came from a, a fairly humble background. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I was mediocre in most things. You know, education, sport, relationships. I was m Mr. Ordinary and I, I recognise that, uh, you know, I was, I was that. I was an ordinary man with an extraordinary God. And I think um, I, I, I just can continue to, uh, to consider the potential of failure um, that's just round the corner. The potential's always there to do the wrong thing, to say the wrong thing, to, to fall, to, to commit sin if you want, you know, and it's always there. Um, and the potential to fail uh, is always there. And that keeps me humble and it keeps me uh, recognizing that I need to keep close to the Lord and keep close accounts with the Lord. And uh, it says in the scripture, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think every day, uh, you know, a part of the, the start of the prayer is, Lord, uh, you know, lead me and guide me, guard my tongue, guide my hands was a prayer that I used all the time. Fill me with your spirit and, and just lead me in today and whatever I have to do. And that is, that is, uh, that keeps me humble. And the fact that my golf handicap is going up and up and up, <laughs> even although I'm playing more than I used to when I worked. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, um, so the same uh, question to you then, uh, Mark. How do you uh, stay humble when everything's going well? Yeah, there's um, there's a there's a there's a famous phrase um, that came out in the 19th century about power corrupting. And let let me just read that to you. Absolute power corrupts. If a person saves himself from abuse of power, he or she is a humble person. As our businesses get bigger and things happen around us, we need, we need to keep our feet on the ground. So um, as the business has got bigger, I'm not sure where the kettle is, but remarkably, a cup of tea arrives most mornings from when I get to work. Um, I've not washed a car for, for many, many years, but my car's always clean when I go home. And I'm grateful for the support I get from my colleagues, which enables me to do my job more effectively and as a Christian, but we've got to be so careful that things don't run away with themselves and we do keep grounded. Yeah. And that's a real challenge for me and maybe for other people who'll go on to listen to this broadcast, but um, how do we keep our feet in the ground? The big one for me is when, you know, I've been taken care of so well at work by my colleagues and the working day has gone well, I, I arrive at home and I almost expect home to function the same as at work. <laughs> so, my wife won't have any of that, of course, because we believe in equality in our marriage. And of course, we've got two boys who aren't my employees. But of course, we now have, I now got boys in, in their late teens. I just tipped over 20. And um, I've got people their age working with me. And when I ask for somebody to be done, it gets done. And the real problem as you lead a business is you apply the same principles at home, or you try to and fail instantly, um, than you do in the workplace. Um, so my family certainly keep keep me humble and keep me accountable uh, yeah. but also one or two pals and in fact my church leader um our, she, an amazing woman uh nikki eastwood would sunday by sunday make sure we're rooted and uh we're rooted with the right foundation blocks in our lives um if i'm very honest it's not always easy but it's something i'm acutely aware of yeah david i know you've just uh, joined but um how, how do you stay humble when things are going well I, I, uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to join, guys. Um, I'm sorry I was a little bit late there. Um, 
very easy for me uh, to keep humble. Um, uh, you know, I, I believe it's just purely by the grace of God that I'm still here and doing what I'm doing. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many things from a personal point of view, but also from a business point of view, that I could be so much better at uh, and develop um, so, so in a, from a business point of view, so much, much better in a professional way. Um, that I, there's just there's just not a single moment where I think I could get above myself uh, uh, at all. Um, uh, and so, if you look at the success of Mark, uh, I understand you know um, what he was saying uh, regarding you know going home and expecting things to happen the same. And, and as he was saying that, I, I thought to myself, "Crikey, I'm the other way around. I'm almost treating business like I am treating people at home sometimes." Um, you know, and that in itself causes, causes me problems sometimes. Um, so very, very, very easy for me to stay humble because, um, I, I do believe that, you know, it's God that covers for a mood of shortfalls that I have and, um, you know, but for him being involved and, you know, opening doors and things working out better than perhaps they should have done, um, you know, you know, uh, business wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be growing like it is. So, um, uh, but also I think, you know, having a faith, uh, and trying to live my life through faith and I'm, you know, I'm not brilliant at that, um, at all. Um, that keeps you rooted as well because you, you have to appreciate what you have and who's around you and who God's placed around you, which I do with my family. Um, so yeah, it, it's not difficult for me at all to stay humble. I can assure you of that. I'm sort of overwhelmed by the generosity of God, really, rather than anything else. That's great. All right. Well, gents, I wish we could uh, stay on and chat longer, but our time's uh, coming to an end. I'm going to hand over to Alan just to pray for us. And Alan, before we, uh, before you pray, if anyone's listening and they want to know this God who these men have been talking about and who's kept them humble and who's who they're working for. Um, how, how does someone come to know this living God? Well, the Bible says we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. We're all born with a sin nature. and We can't go to heaven with that nature. We have to be changed. And so that's why Jesus came. He died on a cross in our place to take the punishment for our sins. And he said, unless a man is born again, he will never see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. We have to have an experience where our spirit is reborn. And what we have to do, the Bible says, Jesus said it, John the Baptist said it, repent and believe. Those are the two keys, repent. Repent means to turn away from the life you've been living, turn away from the way you've disobeyed God, you've broken his laws. And then to believe means to receive. It means to invite Jesus into your heart and life. And if you do that, he will come into your life. He will give you new life. You can become a child of God. And if you'd like to do that, I'd like to just pray a little prayer. And if you want that, just pray this prayer with me right now if you really want this. Lord Jesus Christ, I confess that I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. But I believe you died on the cross in my place. You took the punishment for my sins and you poured out your precious blood to wash my sins away. I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. I turn to you with all my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my life right now by your Spirit. And give to me the free gift of eternal life. I receive you now. Thank you for coming into my life. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus Christ is Lord. And God has raised him from the dead. Yes. And I thank you, Lord, for saving me. For making me a child of God. Amen. 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 Well, gentlemen, let me uh, thank you again. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, Alan. 
thank you, David, for coming on, and uh, thank you, uh, George, for hosting this, uh, being the host for us. It's been great. This has been uh, BMF with uh, Man to Man, and we'll see you next time. God bless.